Hey, it's always fun to be interviewing a, uh, I, you, you feel, I feel like you're my brother. I mean, I've known you on Dental Town. How long have you been a townie on Dental Town? Since the year 2000. 2000. Now it's 2014. How many posts do you have? I didn't check. Uh, I don't know, six, 7,000. Oh, I know. I mean, you're, you're yeah. it, it's, it's a few guys like you that just made Dental Town a must, uh, a must go to. So I want to thank you for all the sharing you've oh, done. Thank, um, thank you for putting it on. You've been a huge pioneer in uh, implantology. You put out that course on Dentaltown, Implants Made Easy. Um, you've had two books on implants, uh, Implants Made Easy and Guided Implantology Made Easy. Um, I have to tell you, you know, I'm. Uh, we were just on the same um, lecture format. Where was that at? Uh, Nashville, weren't we? Nashville. Yeah, yeah. A couple, just a couple of weeks ago. But um, I would say if you're inside a football stadium, you know, you know, everybody's looking at the, at the football. And the football right. right now, the hottest topic in dentistry is um, basically we've gone from a 2D x-ray machine to a 3D. And right. and the law of unintended consequences, this is massively changing everything, especially implants. And some of those threads on Dentaltown about um, CBCTs and guided implants, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's where the football is. And that's why I'm right. so glad to have the master himself. I mean, you've been, I know you are, you've been pioneering this stuff for a decade. I, I have your book right here. I wish I could uh, pan the camera over, but uh, um, tell us what, what's happened to dentistry going from 2D to 3D radiographs. Well, I mean, uh, in the past, we've had to really extrapolate a lot from 2D. We had to almost guess sometimes. Um, you know, my, the, the biggest thing that I love having a combi in, in my office for is not even implants, it's endo. Um, how many times have we taken angled x-rays to try to figure out where extra canals are? Or my biggest pet peeve is trying to diagnose any sort of problem on an upper molar. I'm looking for a radiolucency in a giant radiolucency, the maxillary sinus. So um, the biggest thing I think that 3D has given us is the ability to see more things rather than having to kind of guess. And I don't know anybody who went 3D who wants to go back to 2D. Oh, no. It's no, like no. I don't know anybody who lost their vision and is glad. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, – so, so let, let's start with the basics. There's a lot of machines out there, and I'm sure a lot of reviewers are saying, August, come on. Uh, the, the, those things are like a hundred thousand uh, dollars. First yeah. of all, first of all, what machine did you go with, and what what are your uh, what's your short list of uh, recommendations if some dentist is going to go two D to three D? Oh, definitely. Um, well, I I went with Serona, uh, and I have the um, Galios Comfort Plus, which is their large field of view machine. Um, you know, uh, it depends on what you really want to do with it. Um, I think the biggest requirement, um, if you want to use it for endo is making sure that it has a very small, what they call a voxel size or resolution. And I would say 150 uh, microns or below. And the way that uh, K files are set up, the ISO standardization system is that if you have a 10 file, uh, the tip of the 10 file a millimeter back is 100 microns. So if you have a 100 micron machine versus a 200 micron machine, um, the 200 micron machine will only show a canal big enough to stick a 20 file in, whereas a 100 micron machine, you'll be able to uh, see a canal small enough for a 10 file. So I would say the, the big thing is really uh, resolution. Um, but also, if you want to do guided surgery and if you had a, have a CIREC machine, it's you know imperative, I think, that you go with a Serona comb beam because the benefits between the two are really huge as far as being able to make your own surgical guides and just have that crown down accuracy that you can get. So, um, so you're saying the general dentist is going to love this the most for endo. So, so if a dentist out there is saying, well, I don't, I don't do implants, but you're, you're saying you, you like yours the most for endo and then implants well, would be yeah. number two. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, just, uh, I guess if I could backpedal a little bit, just overall diagnosis, I think, uh, is where cone beams really shine. 
because we can diagnose endo problems. We can diagnose if the patient has enough bone. Um, but yeah, number uh, number one use that I have it for in my office day in and day out is is endo. Number two use is implants. And what uh, is the number one cause of endo failure? Missed anatomy, right? Right. So, yeah. when, so when you're looking at these uh, maxillary molars, what percent of the time? Uh, well, first of all, your guest best guesstimate of the 120,000 general dentists in America, if they all did a molar endo today on a maxillary first molar, what percent of them would just do three canals? Like ninety percent of them. Ninety percent. And what and yeah. what percent of those teeth do you think have more than three canals? Uh, I don't remember the actual research. No, but I think in, in, it, your, in your in your observation, I, I was, uh, at, at least sixty percent. Sixty percent. And how yeah. often do you see a fifth canal? Ooh, not very much. And where you, where do you think the most missed canals are? Maxillary first molar be number one, and then oh, would yeah. you say uh, the distal canal and mandibular second molars? Uh, yes, yes, most definitely. Um, and you know, it's, it's even the more benign things, um, like you're going through a crown on an upper second premolar and usually upper second premolars only have one canal, but a lot of them have two canals. And so just being able to look at that before you even start the endo and say, okay, well, look, if I have to go through this, this crown, I've got to really make my access a little more palatal and, and find that extra canal. So it's good and bad because, you know, Sometimes in the past, I would just give up, you know, looking for a canal. If I trough for a while and I didn't find a canal, I'd say, eh, it's not there because I was only using 2D. Uh, but now it's 3D and I know that canal is there. So I really have to work hard to, to make sure I find that extra canal. And what percent of your um, molars are you doing in one appointment? What, what's your thing? What, what makes uh, August go two appointment versus one? Really, the only uh, I probably do about 95 percent of them one appointment. Uh, the five percent would just be uh, I, the inability to dry the canals. Yeah. So if the blood is just shooting out of it, or pus is just shooting out of it, uh, put calcium hydroxide in there and let them go away for about two weeks, and then and, come back in. And it doesn't matter to you if there's a periapical radiolucency to one step it. <sighs> you know, um, there, there has been re a lot of research out there, uh, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of people, especially in Dental Town, that will not do one appointment with a radiolucency. When uh, I have someone with a radiolucency, I just really soak that tooth in uh, sodium hypochlorite for a solid half an hour. Uh, but I do fill uh, at the end, and, and I, I think my success rate is good. What do, uh, what, do, what do you think about going out the apex with like a very small six file to uh, – um, you know, kind of stir up that periapical radiolucency or get some bleeding in there to kind of break that down. Do you think that's a little too aggressive or? Oh, no, no, no. I always, I always make sure all my canals are patent. So I'm always going out the end of my canals with at least an eight or a 10 file, depending on the, how big the canal is. So uh, I always want to make sure that I have patency. Okay. So let's uh, leave endo and go into uh, implantology. Um, okay. um, what percent of your implants do you place um, with guided? Uh, probably about 95 percent. 95, 95 percent. And, and what and back to all the dentists in America, what percent of the implants placed or do you think are done with guided technology? Uh, probably less than 10 percent. So I think most are done freehand. And that's where I'm telling you the football is right now in dentistry, you know. Yeah. Um, so so so. August, talk talk to these dentists. What is the advantages of using guided implantology versus just laying a big flap and looking at it with your eyes and uh and just uh, doing it uh, free handed? What would you call it? What what is non guided called? Would you call just, it just non guided, just free hand? Yeah, uh, free hand. So so yeah. what so what what do you, what are you thinking? I mean I mean we have, we have oral surgeons on dental town like Jay Resnick that will not only use guided, and then you have right. oral surgeons that said I've never used a guided. So so yeah. walk us through that. Okay, well, there's a lot of things. One, you know, not disrupting the periosteum means that we don't disrupt blood supply, blood supply to the bone. So the bone always has a blood supply if you can either do a punch, which sometimes you can't do a punch, but, or at least lay a really, really small flap. Um, that's one thing. Uh, Post-op pain, um, just, it goes without saying that, you know, making an itty bitty four millimeter hole in the gum is less painful than a big old flap. Um, the, but the biggest thing for me is accuracy and safety. Um, you know, I'm worried about nerves and I'm worried about adjacent teeth and I'm worried about sinuses. Um, I can see all that ahead of time, make sure I plan my implant where it should be. 
um, and avoid those things. Um, the other thing is crown down in plantology. That's the big buzzword in uh, dentistry. I'm doing more and more screw retained final restorations. And one drawback of the screw retained restoration is that screw hole has to be in a very exact position. It can't be on a cusp uh, or you're going to break porcelain around. It can't be coming out the buckle or the lingual or it'll be ugly. Um, I don't like my implants to be shoved to one side or the other, uh, causing you to have a mesial or distal cantilever to the crown. I like it dead center. Um, in the anterior, I want my implants coming out of the cingula of the teeth not the incisal edge, obviously. So being able to get that accuracy, um, for me, um, I could not do it non-guided. I'd have well, to. Okay, well, let me stop you there. So why do you want to screw retained implant versus a cemented? Uh, well, cemented uh, restorations, of course, uh, I've always done those in the past because that's just what I'm used to. I, I have my little nub and I glue my crown on top of the nub and that's what I've always done as a dentist. Um, but what we're just finding is that, you know, uh, it's hard to sometimes get subgingival cement out and that cement is causing problems. Um, sometimes abutment screws loosen up and if you have a non-screw retained restoration, sometimes it's tough to get back into the screw access. Um, the other thing is just repairability. Um, sometimes people break porcelain or, uh, you know, things change and, you know, it's really easy to unscrew a screw retained uh, versus having to cut off a, uh, a conventional cemented restoration. So it's the same argument with uh, endodontists when they talk about obturating a, a tooth with a, a carrier, uh, right. like thermophil. You know, that's all great. Everything's fine, but it's nice. It, it, it makes it more difficult to uh, take out and retrieve. So, you, so you like the the uh, the retrievability of this? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so so when. Um, so you have a Cirac CAD cam, I mean, a CAD yes. cam, uh, yep. which is made by Serona. And Serona uh -huh. also makes a 3D X-ray Galileos. Right. Walk, walk us through more specifically to someone who's never seen a surgical guide and have the first uh -huh. idea. The first question I want to ask you is, to, to someone who's never placed an implant, does this make it easier? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like, like how much easier? Is there any way to quantify that? I mean, has this has this lowered the bar? I, I remember back in yeah. the day when I got out of school. I'm uh, I got out ten years before you did. Um, that's why you look like a Calvin Klein model, and I look like I just fell out of a car. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I went, th went through Carl Misch, got my fellowship in the missions too, my diplomat uh -huh. in the International Congress for Implantology. You had a 2D pano. You'd lay these big flaps. You'd think uh -huh. you had an inch of bone and it'd be paper. And, and you and you know, it, it was just, you really had to be a surgeon to place implants in the 80s. Right. But right. now, not so much. Would you say that? Yeah. I, I say that, yeah, the integration between Cirrhic and Galileos has done quite a bit to uh, to make it easier. Um, you know, again, if we, if we look at Cirac and Galileos, we call it Cirac and Galileos integration. Um, you know, the most basic form is that we get a, a crown form in Cirac, we put it in the Galileos, we move our implant around underneath and into the right position, and then uh, send away to uh, Germany, a lab in Germany called CCAT, and they make us a surgical guide. That's the most basic form, uh, and that works out great. Um, another uh, aspect of Cirac and Galileos integration is what's called Cirac Guide. And Cirac Guide is a way of milling your own surgical guide in your office, uh, which I think is really powerful, um, especially if you do a lot of immediate implants. Uh, immediate implants, you pull a tooth, you stick an implant um, in, but the problem is, is you have to drill a hole in a tooth socket which is usually in the wrong position. So um, I use Cirac Guide a lot on immediates, and I think that's a, a great, great thing. Now, so, is that the standard milling unit, or did you have to get the lab milling unit? Uh, it's it's the MCXL, but it's not the lab MCXL. If you have the newer milling unit uh, since 2000, and, I don't know. Do, do you do you have a surgical guide at your desk, or do you have one that you can hold up? Uh, or? Uh, yeah, I think I could probably dig one up. Um, hang on a second. So, uh, yeah. So, this is a standard surgical guide. And you uh, can mill that out in your office? Oh, no, 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 no. This that, is a surgical guide. Um, this is Cirac guide. 
And Cerec Guide is made up of two components. Uh, thermoplastic tray material makes up the body and the hole and the height of the guide and the angulation of the guide, it's hard to see, is this clear piece that Cerec mills out. And does that limit your, your depth too with that surgical guide? It does. It does. Depth angulation um, and, um, yeah, depth and angulation. And so if someone has, um, how would you compare, what type of surgical skills could you compare that to um, if this dentist is doing extractions? I mean, do you have to be good at pulling wisdom teeth or impacted wisdom teeth? Uh, compare the surgical skills of extractions versus placing implants with a surgical guide. Well, first off, I don't do impacted wisdom teeth. And so that's scary for me. <laughs> so I think implants are quite a bit uh, less scary and less uh, surgically intensive, I think, than, than surgical extractions. That's for sure. Um, if you're placing an implant guided, I always tell people, um, really, the motions and the parts and pieces are no different than doing a stainless steel post on tooth number three. Um, you know, there's tooth number three. Let's say you're going to put the post in the palatal canal. That palatal canal is going to guide your drills. And you're going to start with some round bird, maybe some piezos, and maybe a post drill. Uh, when you're doing guided implantology, you do about the same thing. You use something to enter into the bone, like a, a land spur or a round bird. Then you go through your series of drills, maybe about two or three drills, and then you put your implant in. So the actual surgical skills of guided implantology are almost operative, uh, like doing a filling or doing a post. Uh, it's very non-surgical if, if you're doing punches, which, of course, we can't do punches on every case. Um, a lot of the times, you know, the bone needs to be recontoured or there's not enough good attached tissue, and then you just can't do it that way. And what percent, um, talk about whether you can immediately load this. Um, do you, um, what, what, what percent of the time do you mill out the Cerac crown after you mm -hmm. place the implant and, uh, and place the, uh, the final restoration? Well, um, there's kind of a difference there. There's uh, wanting to put on a temporary and then going for it and going for the final restoration. Um, I think everything really uh, boils down to how much torque you get on the implant. So you can't immediately load or temporize uh, an implant unless you have at least 35 Newton centimeters of torque. Now, And what I, percent of the time do, would you achieve that? Um, I don't know. I, uh, on a, a healed site, um, almost 100% of the time, maybe 90% of the time. Uh, on an immediate extraction, that's tougher because the implant's really only being held in the bone by about three or four millimeters of bone. Um, and so that's maybe 50-50. And I make it a, a real point to tell a patient if they broke a, a number eight off of the gum line, you know, uh, I'm going to do my best to put an implant in and get it in tight enough so we can put a temporary on you. But, uh, you know, if we can't, then you're going to have to wear a flipper. Um, and so the important part with immediates is never to promise the patient they're going to get a tooth that day. Yeah, and I also want to tell my uh, fellow dentists out there is that uh, that's one of the reasons I think warranting your work five years is intense because so mm -hmm. many dentists, when a patient snaps a number eight at the gum line, will do a heroic root canal, a heroic post buildup, place a crown, and think they did a good job and take 2500 bucks for the patient, and they walk back in with their hand mm -hmm. a year later, and they're just like, well, you know, I tried. I tried. It's like, well, trying isn't good enough. You're a doctor. Yeah. And, and if you can't guarantee your work for five years, you got to diagnose a little aggressive, more aggressive. And I was diagnosed aggressively enough to where I have no problems warranting what I did for five years. That's great advice. Yeah, I, I heard you say that back in your uh you know, 30 day dental MBA uh, days. And I've done that too. And one of the great things about being a general dentist that places implants is we have that option. Um, you know, even if you don't, you know, you can always send the patient out, but I mean, having that in your option, I, I try not to do heroics. I mean, I, I sometimes do, uh, and it still bites me in the ass, but, um, I try not to do heroics. And and um, and it's also makes me leery of the endodontist who can't place an implant because I see it in Phoenix all the time. The dentist, the endodontists who don't place implants, no matter what you send them, they'll say, "Well, I'll try," and they they do they retreat the tooth, they do the root canal. But if they have CBCT, they see the mesial buccal roots fractured, 
mm-hmm. they can still make money. You know, they'll extract the tooth, place an implant, right. do whatever. But if your only tool is a root canal and you're an endodontist, that might right. not be the best guy to refer to. You might look uh, at it referring to someone who's got a CBCT yeah. and can make money saying, you know what? I don't think we should do a root canal. I think we should pull this this tooth mm-hmm. and, uh, and place an implant. So um, so about your books, what, what year did your books Implant Made Easy and Guide Implantology Made Easy? What year did those come out? I think Implants Made Easy came out in uh, 2010 and Guided Implantology Made Easy was 2013. 2013. So for someone out there... Um, one of these listeners, um, they, they've never placed an implant. They're, right. They don't have a CBCT. Walk us through those two books and, uh, and how can they order those? And, and what, what, how would these books help their journey to 3D sure. and guide implantology? Well, uh, Implants Made Easy is actually based on the thread on Dental Town Implants for Dummies. And uh, in Implants for Dummies, what I did was I started placing implants and I wanted to just post a bunch of stuff that I thought was important uh, to learn along the way and and kind of post my cases and get critiques from guys that have been doing it for a lot longer. So uh, Implants Made Easy is um, basic lay a flap implantology. It's just uh, how to do simple single single units. There's some stuff on, you know, a little bit on restorative aspect of it, but it's mostly just garden variety implants and anatomy. Um, the second book, uh, Guided Implantology Made Easy, um, focuses uh, much more on guided surgery and um, more specifically how Sirek and Galileos talk nice to each other and how to mill out your own surgical guides or to use, you know, uh, do an edentulous case and, and how to integrate Sirek uh, scan of the patient's denture into the, uh, into the, the plan. And how would the how would these viewers purchase these books? Where would they go to? Uh, implantsmadeeasy.com. There's a implantsmadeeasy.com. Yeah. Implants plural madeeasy.com. Yeah. Okay, and um, now on this Im- guided implantology made easy. Does this book only apply if you went with uh, Serona's uh, Galeos? What what if they bought a, a Care Stream or another CBCT? Yeah, well, there, there's definitely some some cool stuff in there. Um, one thing, and, and I know you know this, you've been placing implants longer than I have, so you know this more, but, um, you know, teeth have certain angulations. So they have the curve, you have the curve of Wilson and you have the curve of speed. And what I did was uh, I have a little atlas in there that has tooth diameters and what size implants to use and what the average angulation buccolingually of number eight is. Um, so although the, the book is, is geared more towards Syrac and Galeos, uh, even if you have, if you're using an Admage or using Noble Guide or whatever, I think they could benefit from it. And what makes you decide if you're going to send, uh, a surgical guide to Germany and have it made uh-huh. versus mill out your own? What, what, what is your thoughts there? Yeah, multiple units. So, um, I use Syrac Guide for single units, but if I have multiple units, I send it out to Germany. Uh, what, Syrac, you can do multiple units with Syrac Guide, but it's it's really hard. And, and, so, and what what about the fully dentulous? If you're talking about you know putting uh, fully dentulous, yeah, yeah, definitely you want to send that out. You can't mill that in Syrac Guide. And and what are you doing on, on a fully dentulous? Because you know um, the bottom line is you know men die on average seventy four. It's women who almost go to eighty. Um, if some so so most of these older ladies with denture problems, you know, most of them are females. Um, right. Do you do you have a low cost like two implants, uh, medium cost like four the hater and and a high cost six implants and a bridge or or do 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 those or do you have a more of a just standard four on the floor or what what talk talk about the uh, the, the the different options for the patients yeah, yeah the eighty year old tell me that it's an eighty year old lady full denture she's having a hard time chewing. Yeah, if she if if someone you know is just wants something to nail the denture down, I typically do two implants with uh, uh, we call them GPS attachments or locator attachments, and just retrofit their denture. Um, you know, I have to be honest with you, I don't uh, have little packages. I probably should. Uh, I just we diagnose individual implants, and we have a charge for an implant, the attachment, and stuff like that. Um, uh, do, I, do, do you, are you getting success with two implants retrofitting a lower mandibular oh, yeah. denture? Well, I mean, you know, the important thing is talk to your patient and see what your patient wants and how much they can afford. But you're always going to get more retention 
uh, on a lower than uh, without implants. So yeah, that's that's been greatly successful. Patients love it. Is that your go-to to implants with locator attachments, or is it more for hybrids. implants or high or what, what? What is your go-to? I love hybrids. What, what if it was your mom, eighty years old, full denture? Your August mom, full denture, eighty years old. August, I can't really chew. My lower is flopping around. Yeah, you know, I mean, I uh, this is going to sound cruel, but I mean, I would tr- still try to talk to me about hybrid. I mean, when you're eighty, you know, you're. I, I, it's not my job to determine how long you're going to live, but I just know that you're going to really like to eat during the years that you're around. So, um, I, I tell them, Hey, you know, the best thing is a hybrid. Um, they can't always do it. So Explain what a hybrid is to our viewers. Oh, I'm sorry. A hybrid is a screw retained denture. It's a screw retained bridge. Um, you know, I personally, uh, can get away with four implants on the lower and doing a hybrid. If, we have something called the AP spread and the AP spread is the distance between the most anterior implant to the most posterior implant. And we can cantilever back 1.5 times that. So if I have enough AP spread to not do removable, I try to talk them into a hybrid if they can afford it. Um, on the upper, hi- like- so a hybrid is, is a fixed that doesn't fixed. touch the tissue, but it's, but you can remove it. Yes, I can unscrew it. Uh, but the patient can't. Okay. Yeah. And what I and what I what I really like about this is one of my pet peeves with our profession. It seems like dentists are more engineers. They're always talking about um, adhesive rates, wear rates, you know, micron right. fits. And it seems like almost all the dentistry I do gets destroyed by gram negative anaerobes. I mean, it's streptococcus mutans and peach and So I see dentistry as a biological problem, not an engineering problem. And what I love about implants is when I go into these nursing homes in my, my area, I got a dozen nursing homes in my zip code. And when I oh, wow. go in there, August, I mean, those ladies aren't in there for a year and root surface decay, decay has just bombed out their entire mouth. And those oh, yeah. ladies that got titanium, they don't get cavities. No. Yeah, and, no, and, even, and they're perio. I don't even like calling it periodontal disease around implants because it's totally different. Uh, yeah. You know, irritated gums is not periodontal disease. Would, would you say right. that periodontal disease is massively different around implants versus teeth? It is. It's weird. Um, you know, it's interesting. If you have a real deep pocket on a tooth, a lot of the times there's pus and stuff like that. Sometimes you can have bone loss around an implant and have, you know, a 10 millimeter pocket and there's no pus. There's yeah. no infection and you know it's it's you sit there and think what do i do you know uh do i is this implant going away or what do i do i tend to watch things like that but it's amazing how there's no redness pain or any signs of infection around these areas where you have peri implantitis yeah i I mean i mean first of all if a person got full mouth gum disease you extract all the teeth the gums look all firm and pink in two weeks i mean like perfect yeah something the tooth has something to do with the entire disease and irritation around a titanium implant august walk me through this i'm having an ethical problem in my own mind and my own practice um you know men you know, they all worry about prostate cancer and all these different things. They all die of a heart attack. It's just kind of like the public. They all worry about dying in an airplane and they all end up dying in their car. Men, <laughs> men, men, men aren't an issue with me. But these sure. women, you go into these nursing homes and it's a, it's 99% women and they live so long. And so many times I'm, you know, seeing dentistry I did over the last 25, 26 years. It doesn't even last a year in a nursing home. Right. And, right. and, and then I, I start wondering, you know, that lady was 65 and I took 2,500 bucks for her and saved a badly broken down molar with a root canal buildup and crown. Gosh, right. if I would have extracted that and done an implant in a crown, it would have mm-hmm. been immune to root surface decay, streptococcus immune hands. And then, and then if they have a history of like Alzheimer's or dementia, are you starting to look at a 65 year old lady with a broken down molar saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about this lady when she's 80 than at Mm -hmm. 65 and maybe I shouldn't be doing endo on ladies over 65. I mean, have have you ever, does that cross your mind or does that play with your thinking? Uh, It, it doesn't, you know, from that time frame that you're talking about, but, but I will say that, you know, if I look at a tooth that's had endo and it's a perfect endo and there's still PA lesions, I'm much less likely to retreat. 
Um, if I can get my cone beam and go in there and know that I found all the canals, I still got to the apex, I'm more likely to offer the patient either going to an endodontist to have it retreated, because uh, I don't want to retreat it because I don't think it's going to work, um, or taking out and doing implants. So my, um, my gutsiness is much less now that I have implants and I know how well they work. But, but yeah, I understand your point. I mean, um, but should we give up on endo? I don't think so. I mean, um, who knows if the tooth that you did at 65 would be around at 90. I hope it would. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, yeah. You know, when people say the golden age of dentistry is over, I say, absolutely. Now it's the titanium age. And what, yeah. I, love, and what I love about titanium, it's, it's immunity to gram negative anaerobes. Cause that's, yeah. that's what we do. So, yeah. so, so I, I want to switch gears here. Uh, okay. we're halfway through this. Um, pretend I'm a, uh, 30 year old woman dentist who just graduated five years ago from the dental school up the street. And okay. I'm like, August, I've never placed an implant. I got a 2D pano. Um, really? Should, I mean, should I spend a hundred thousand dollars and buy a CBCT and get into guide implant? This, this, this is, this is a huge decision. And, and sure. I notice on dental town, I, I look at their search results. You know, I look at what right. people are searching for every month right. and I'm, I guarantee you, as the decision starts costing six figures, like yeah. CAD CAM or CBCT, I mean, that's right. all the searches. And you're the man in this area, and they're searching, right. reading your threads. Talk to talk to this 30-year-old woman dentist. Uh, should she really commit this kind of money? Well, you know, you got to— and, she, yeah. and she's going to tell you—and and the first thing she's going to say to you is this. I still got $300,000 of student loans, and I bought right. a practice that cost four hundred. dollars I'm already $700,000 in debt— Right. And now August is telling me to, to go deeper. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, it, it's a really tough decision, to be honest with you. I mean, whenever you buy a piece of dental equipment, you need to say to yourself, you know, is it going to make money? Is it going to uh, generate enough net income, not gross income, net income to make the payment? Um, and, and comb beams are expensive, no doubt about it. If, if uh, this person is not, do let's say they're not doing endo, they just want to buy it just for implants. I would say on the first, I don't know, 10, 20 cases, send the patient out to a scanning center and, and see the scans and do the implant off of that. Um, but what I found very early on was that, um, you know, the more, the more scans I did, the more I found I was doing a lot more implants and I was seeing cases that I could tackle. So it's, it's a tough call. When you have a lot of debt, obviously, you don't want to throw, you know, more money on it. But the other thing is diagnosing. I mean, I diagnosed so much more endo um, than I ever did in retreats and things like that because now I can see everything. Um, so if you're a GP doing endo and doing implants, um, I would say, yeah, I would say go for it. You know, if you're buying it just for implants and you've never placed an implant before, I'd say, you know, wait, wait until you get to a point where you're doing more implants to justify the cost. Okay. And what would you say to this, Dennis, if she said to you, um, well, shouldn't I take an implant course first? Um, yeah. should I guess, what, what, what course would you recommend? What, what would you recommend to to get educated um, in making this that's, decision. That, that's a great question. And it has, I think, more to do with your personality. I mean, you did MISH, which was great. Uh, it was a, a pr pretty big time commitment. Um, I, I don't know if I have adult onset ADHD or whatever, but I can't pay attention for more than 20 minutes. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there, there's lot, lots of courses out there that you can kind of do a la carte. Like I know Garg has some great courses. I've got a buddy, uh, Todd Engel from the Engel Institute, uh, where you can take these a la carte four day classes where they'll teach you, you know, how to do a basic implant with a flap and just you'll get a live patient and then you'll you'll do it. Do, can, uh, you, can you drop some contact information? How do they contact Garg or Engel? Do you know their uh, WWW uh, is? Garg, I, I think his website is called implantseminars.com. Okay. And I, I think the Engel Institute is uh, engelinstitute.com. That's spelled E N G E L, uh, Engel. Um, where's he, he out of Kelly? He's in North Carolina, North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, but I would, I would definitely, definitely say that if you're going to learn how to do implants, you need to do a course with some live patients. You got to do it on, on a live body. And, um, you know, again, I know Garg uh, has this thing in the Dominican Republic where people go in, they place like 
some god awful amount, like 30 or 60 implants over a weekend. And it's all on patients and they're doing sinus lifts and all sorts of crazy stuff. So, um, if you take a course where all you do is learn on a model, um, I don't think that's going to cut it. I think you need to, to make sure that you do a course with live bodies. And I, I want to throw one answer to that in too. That was great, excellent advice. Garg's uh, tearing it up out there. Um, all my friends have gone to Dominican Republic. They loved it. But I want to say another thing is uh, if you don't have any money, um, if you call your local oral surgeon and periodontist, I mean, they oh, yeah. all they all want a friend. And, yeah. and, and, and you're thinking, well, he's not going to teach me how to place an implant because then he's going to lose business. So why would he teach me to lose business? Because I'm sending around. And that's just not the way 90% of them think. I mean, right. and, and, and same thing with the ortho. Every orthodontist is telling me that every general dentist that wants to do ortho, they're all afraid of telling him or whatever. And right. they gladly help any one of them. And usually after two or three or four years, the dentist is done with that phase of his life. <laughs> then yeah. He gets all the referrals. And, yeah. and in fact, I know several, I know several orthodontists who a general dentist gets into ortho and a year later says, Oh my God, will you take all my cases? And they go, absolutely. So, oh, yeah. so, so yeah, call your perinons, call your oral surgeon yeah. right across the street. They're going to help you. Um, yeah. so, so what, so, um, so on looking at failed root canals, are you, is the CBCT helping you, um, that is just missed anatomy or are you also seeing root fractures? Like on a max ray molar, are you seeing that the mesial buccal root is fractured and, and if they were using 2d x-ray and did a retreat, it wouldn't have healed up anyway because it was fractured. Are you seeing root fractures causing failures or is it mostly yes. missed anatomy? Mostly missed anatomy. Um, mm. As far as root fractures go, remember, um, you know, we're limited by the resolution of the machines. So if I have a hundred micron voxel size machine, that crack has to be at least a hundred microns uh, thick to show up. That's a pretty big crack. I mean, you could definitely see that on an x-ray. So what we're seeing more is the sequela of a root fracture. So a deep vertical pocket, um, you know, a lateral uh, PA lesion, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, that tells us more fractures. But but I would say most of the uh, endo failures are due to missed anatomy. Okay, but d describe that more for the person listening to this on a podcast. Um, describe more of what this would look like on a CBCT. Uh, the, this, uh, uh, you're not seeing the fracture, but you're seeing... Right, the pathology around it. You're seeing it, it vertical would, pockets. Would, you're seeing yeah, it's a big, huge bunch of bone loss on the side of the tooth, uh, ending, you know, mid root. You know, if you have, you know, a, uh, a PA lesion or an abscess that's blown out, you'll see the fistula or the sinus tract going from the end of the apex all the way up. But if you see a lucency, just kind of go all the way down the root and stop mid root. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, a horizontal fracture, at least there, um, or a vertical root fracture. So it's easy to see that. It's hard to see the actual fracture itself. Okay. And, and August, there's, um, what about, what about surgical guides? If, uh, um, there's other threads about surgical guides, uh, blue, blue sky, blue uh, sky, yeah. uh yeah. Armin, Armin is, is doing, uh, surgical guides. Uh, what, yeah. what, what any commentary on those methods or? Yeah, you know, they're all good. Um, you know, I think it depends on um, really how much hand-holding you want. Um, you know, I know um, Anatomage makes some great surgical guides. Uh, Rowe Dental Labs, I know, works with Blue Sky uh, to do it as well. Um, my thing with Serona and Galeos is that they're, they're so anal. Um, they reject scans on me left and right. They tell me, August, do you really want to get that close to the nerve? You know, so there's always someone reading my scans and kind of getting my back. And, and um, I don't know if it's true with other companies, but I know Serona uh, will give you a certificate of accuracy where they'll actually test the accuracy of your surgical guide versus your plan. Um, I don't know if they do that on a model. I don't know exactly how they do that. So um, there's lots of guide companies out. It's all good. Uh, there's lots of good guides. I can't say that one company is better than the other, but for me, I like Serona because I like that hand holding that I get from them. Okay, and then I want to talk about another area. So, you know, we generally think of uh, four types of bone in the jaw that the lower anterior mandible is hard as oak, back mm. is more like balsa, uh, the yeah. front's more like styrofoam. Um, 
For someone, a newbie getting into implants, who's, you know, their, their first hundred implants they're going to place over the first yeah. couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Is there any areas of the jaws you'd say start here and avoid here? I mean, uh -huh. are, you know, are like, are you telling them to avoid mandibular posteriors because of the inferior alveolar nerve or the sinuses or is there, yeah. is, does that play into your mind for newbies? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for newbies, you want to stick to maybe D2 or D3 bone or even D1 bone. D1 bone is kind of hard, but... but expl uh, explain that terminology to our viewers. Yeah, so so the anterior mandible is mostly cortical bone. And in dentistry, um, we're always used to drilling holes and sticking things in holes that are smaller than the hole. So if I do an inlay <laughs> prep, the inlay prep is bigger than my inlay. If I do my post prep, uh, it's bigger than my stainless steel or zirconia post. Uh, it's the opposite in implantology. We make small holes and put, we put in big screws. So if I'm in D4 bone and I drill a hole that's slightly smaller than my implant, I'm going to have a spinner and the implant's not going to have any explain, explain D4 bone to someone who doesn't know D1, yeah, D2, D3. Yeah, so so D4 bone is made mostly of trabecular bone. It's The trabecular spaces are very wide. And there's very little cortical bone. So uh, when we want osseointegration, we want bone laid down on our implant. And there's just not a lot of bone in there. And so when you're dealing with D4 bone, it, I might put a 6 millimeter implant, but the diameter of my osteotomy may be 3 millimeters. And I'm going to rely on my implant to somehow, you know, compress the bone into a denser bone. That's kind of tough to manage. And D1 bone, on the other hand, doesn't expand at all. And so when you're drilling into D1 bone, uh, you really have to make your hole almost the same size as your implant. Uh, D2 bone can be tough sometimes. D2 bone has a thick cortical plate, but it has trabecular bone in it. Um, and then D, uh, D, D3 bone is, um, is nice. It's, it's kind of spongy bone, and you make your hole, and your implant expands it. So I don't really tell people to stay away from different types of bone. But yeah, definitely stay away from uh, upper and lower second molars. Um, you can tackle first molars, but make sure you've got tons and tons of bone, you know, 18 millimeters, 16 millimeters of bone and stick in a 10 millimeter implant. Um, I also tell a lot of people stay away from the mental foramen because that can get kind of tricky too. And now, how, where were you in your career when you uh, became a member of Dental Town? You were a dental uh, student, weren't you? No, I, I uh, just got out of my GPR and I bought your 30 day dental MBA and I loved it so much. I watched it over and over and over again. And um, so I think I had, I was an associate when I bought an associate. it, when I got yeah. into dental town. Because I want to ask you a question, but I want to say something first. Um, to me, it seems like um, if I could sum up your career, because I've watched your career for a long time, to oh, sum yeah. up your your success is because you you, the number one the number one trait I see in the most successful dentist is humility. They oh. listen, they learn, they take a lot of CE, they listen to their staff, they listen to their patients. And, and you, you do two traits that you don't see in dentistry. You're so humble and you've always been transparent. Now, you, you know, you're, 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 you've been posting everything you do on dental town. And, um, I, I think that, um, it, it's so counterintuitive because most humans don't want to post any case they've done on dental town because they're afraid someone's going to say, well, it's not perfect. And right. then, and then, if someone says, "Well, I I think you could have done it better if you did this," and they're traumatized, yeah. and and our personalities are the opposite. We we want to hear the feedback to be better. Right. But August, I'm going to throw this question at you. What do you, what do you say? You know, we uh, to these the the, the five thousand dentists who just walked out of dental school. They're three hundred thousand right. dollars in debt, and they're right. thinking, August. Um, well, you know, it was good when you got out of school. But I, I'm I'm getting screwed. This is horrible. And some of these dental graduates have been out five years since the great 2008 economic collapse, Lehman mm -hmm. Brothers, and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. for five years, they've just kind of been shell shocked. So I'm going to ask you this: Is the golden age of dentistry behind us? Should those students have graduated when you did, and not now? And what advice would you tell the graduates and the ones that have been out five, six, seven years? What could they do so that when they're 45, like you? Uh, they'd be sitting there with all these clinical skills and a great practice and crushing it. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is, you know, it, it's always a shitty time in dentistry. Uh, when I got <laughs> out, everyone was telling me the same thing. The golden age is over. And then, you know, you're, you're just going to have a sucky life. Um, and, you know, so I, uh, I tried to work at uh, 
any associateship I could get, the way it works in LA is usually someone's not busy enough to give you five days a week. So you work a day here and a day here and a day here. Um, I would, t- first off, I would tell graduates, don't, don't be stuck up. Um, you know, when, uh, when I went to dental school, it was just very ivory tower, um, kind of stuff. And I worked in HMO clinics. I worked at inner city clinics. Um, I worked in boutique practices. Uh, I worked everywhere and I uh, just, I saw all sorts of different things that I wanted to emulate and, and also some traits that I didn't want to emulate. So that would be number one, but number two, and I learned this from you, um, uh, you know, you can't sell what's on your menu. So, you know, if you don't know how to do endo, take endo courses. If you, you know, don't waste all your time with TMJ and occlusion and all that stuff, which is good to know, but your bread and butter stuff is what you're going to need to do. So take classes on extractions, take classes on how to do a good crown prep, you know, be, be a jack of all trades, you know, be able to treat whatever can walk into your door. And, you know, one of the greatest endodontists in the state of Arizona, if not one of the greatest endodontists in the world is, uh, Brad Gettleman and just uh, ended on us up the street. And uh, you young dentists don't realize that a lot of those guys have open door policies. I mean, if you don't know how to do a perio program, you can just go go spend the day with your parent on us up the street. Uh, yeah. You don't know how to do endo. Go go sit there and just sit on the assistance stool at your end on us. I mean, I, I, I sat for countless hours just watching Brad uh, knocking out molar endo after molar endo, just perfect endo in, right. in under an hour. Um, but yeah, you, you, um, so, so how many hours of CE would you recommend that they take um, when they get out of school? Oh, wow. I, I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean, the, I know the state requirement in California is 25 hours per year. I think you should do more, um, at least 50. I mean, get out there and just get in, uh, get in these classes. You know, it's easier now that there's so much great stuff online on Dentaltown and, and stuff like that. And, and I would also go back to Dentaltown. And, and back to posting. And uh, I learned a lot more by just posting my stuff and getting, sometimes getting a new one ripped <laughs> by an endodontist saying, I can't believe you did such a shitty endo. Uh, you know, and that that hurts. Uh, but the same regard, you know, that criticism stays in the back of my head. And, I, and you know, I, I think posting or taking pictures of your work and posting it online you know, you'll see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you'll get some people that honestly do want to help you, and uh, that that helps a lot. And that is, and that is the counterintuitiveness of success the the right. trans being transparent when everybody else won't show what's in their closet, and that's how you get right. better uh, showing it. So you've talked a lot about endo, you've talked a lot about uh, implants and CIRAC. What what any anything else in your office uh, that you're passionate about or? Describe your private. First of all, what city are you in? You're in uh, Encino. I'm in, I'm in Encino, California. It's uh, outside of Los Angeles. It's a fairly affluent area. Um, so I don't take any HMOs or PPOs. I'm not a Delta dentist, but we do um, um, accept assignment of benefits. Um, I, I think another exciting area, which I don't know a lot about, but I want to learn more, um, is medical billing. Um I think that uh, what we're finding out is there's certain uh, things in dentistry that uh, medical does cover, uh, such as uh, night guards uh, and stuff that we do a lot. And so one aspect of my practice that I'm trying to do more and trying to learn more about is medical billing. And I think that's an exciting area. Because night guards, because you're seeing a lot of TMJ or is this sleep apnea or, you know, uh, is, I, is I, it an affluent area more stressed out grinding their teeth probably, or? Yeah. No, you know, I mean, I, I'm not an expert at all. Uh, I see two things, uh, nocturnal bruxism without TMJ symptoms. Uh, and in those cases we do a flat plane splint. Uh, but then sometimes we do have patients that do have TMJ symptoms. Um, they're clenching or grinding and we'll do an occlusal orthotic or we'll do a, a Michigan appliance on those types of patients. So I'm certainly not educated enough to talk about all the aspects of, of grinding, but what we're finding is dental insurance wouldn't cover them, but so sometimes medical would if you play by the rules. So that's kind of an, an exciting aspect that we're looking more into. I had my mind blown on a CBCT on a case that for the last 27 years, I just would have made a surgical uh, flat plane splint, but I had uh-huh. the CBCT and across my mind, you know, well, look, look at the joints and yeah. there was a piece of bone oh my and, God. and I sent it to um, Dale Miles 
uh, the TMJ guy, and he's like, that needs to be removed. That, that, yeah. That's a huge problem. And and without a CBCT, how could you have seen that? You can't see it. I mean, so. again, I don't, I don't know anybody. So so besides uh, TMJ and medical billing, what what else has uh, got you excited in your in Encino? Oh, good question. I mean, um, <laughs> just uh, working more in my practice. You know, I, I've gotten to a point where, it, and I, I do this all the time in Dental Town. I I lecture so much, and I know you do too. Uh, it's currently right now we're just getting back into marketing our practice, getting more stuff with Facebook. Um, you know, uh, the staff is really taken over and really kind of are reworking my practice and making it more efficient and, and better. So, uh, I practice management, I guess is what's got me excited lately. I gotta give you a, I gotta give you a Facebook tip. I don't know if you know this, but, um, as of the, the, we're, we're talking to the day before Halloween, but, uh, yeah. I have 60,000 friends on my Facebook oh page. My God. So I get so much stuff. I can't even repost what everyone's sending me. So oh, yeah. every single day, I post about, I, I repost like the greatest hits. So if you're building your Facebook page, follow mm-hmm. me at facebook.com Howard Fran and just steal all my oh, stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I, I didn't make any of that stuff. I'm just sharing it yeah. all, but it is no, a repository you, of, uh, you got uh, some great stuff. I'm oh, sure yeah. And stuff. it comes from everywhere. Czechoslovakia, Germany, uh, Brazil, just all, all yeah. over. Um, so I only, I only got you for a uh, nine more minutes. So, um, what do you say to that dentist? Mm-hmm. He's in Parsons, Kansas. Last right. five years, his town's not going anywhere. And he's right. sitting there thinking, I know, I know what he's thinking. He's saying, ah, j- come on, August. You're, you're out in California. You're out in Encino. I'm, I'm stuck right. in Parsons, Kansas. And he wants right. to live in Parsons, Kansas. He's born and raised there. His family's there. All his friends are. What advice sure. would you give that, that, that guy in the middle of the uh, small town rural America? Well, you know, you, you've got to work with your market. So, you know, don't, you know, price yourself out of your market. I mean, although all patients think we're expensive anyway, but, uh, you know, uh, just again, be a jack of all trades, be able to do everything in-house. Um, I love having Cirec and so being able to do crowns in-house saves my lab bill and I can bust things out in one appointment. Uh, learn implants, learn extractions, learn dentures, you know, just treat your patients. You know, it's these people that, you know, are cosmetic dentists or subspecialties of some aspect of dentistry that, you know, are doing fine for a while and then the economy goes to crap and then they lose everything. So just be able to treat everything. And that's great advice because this last recession at, in here in Phoenix at 2008 Lehman's brother, um, we saw about 85 practices go under in Phoenix. And sure. the cosmetic ones were the first to go. And the reason yeah. I always had a bone to pick with those guys is I don't remember applying to dental school, telling them I wanted to do plastic surgery and tummy tucks and veneers yeah. and bleaching. I, I thought we were doctors at first. And I yeah. I always identified more with the public health dentist. And you said when you got out, you worked in HMO clinics and public health clinics. And, and that, that's the way I look. I'm, I'm a fireman. I don't, I don't care if, if what catches fire is an apartment, a trailer, or a mansion. I'm a fireman. That's I great. put out fires. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I, I love doing the extraction on the kid who doesn't speak English and just mm-hmm. snuck into Phoenix, you know, a year ago paying with $20 bills or doing mm-hmm. an elaborate, you know, cosmetic case. I mean, I, I, I always feel the public health dentist is, is, the, is what we're supposed to do, but it's sure. also the best business model. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's always, there's always a patient with a toothache and I don't care who it is. So, yeah. So, so in your last five minutes, take it away Um, again, you know, go, go back to that person five years out of school. Who's uh, looking for direction. Mm -hmm. You're saying online CE, learn to do root canals. Just yet. I mean, you know, get on dental town. I mean, that's, that's the thing too, is that, you know, we're so loners. We're little, weird hermits in our little offices. We don't get out and talk to people. And sometimes it's hard, you know, and sometimes you don't want to. I mean, I, I'm i as grumpy as the next guy. But uh, <laughs> get online and read, you know, everything you can. And if you're a lurker, that's cool. You know, don't worry about it. But, I mean, if you if you have a question, post it on Dental Town, and there's someone who had the same problem you had uh, can help you with it. You know, patient management is hard when you're a newbie. And uh, saying, gosh, you know, I have this patient, she's a you know, total pain in the ass, and she's saying this, and she's saying that. What do I do? What can I say? Sometimes there's phrases we use or, you know, 
let's say you just do a crown on a tooth and it wasn't hurting before, but now all of a sudden the crown hurts, you know, how do you explain that to a patient, you know? Um, and so all that stuff's on dental town. So just get on dental town. Oh, and thank you for that. But you also have a, a website. You're also, um, the media digitally enamel.com. Yeah. Digital Tell enamel. them about that. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, it actually was started, started by Todd Ehrlich and it's not, he's a, out of, he's out of Texas. Where, yeah. where, whereabouts? Uh, he's in, uh, Austin, Austin, Texas. Yeah. It, it's not a message board. It's just us showing cool stuff. And so as he likes to call it dental porn. So <laughs> we take pictures of our pretty pictures of stuff that we do. And actually we like to show the good, the bad and the ugly. We show just, just pictures of digital dentistry. So it's a magazine of digital dentistry. Yeah. And, and Todd Ehrlich, like you also has online CE courses on dental town. You guys yeah. are, you guys are just uh, huge in dentistry and I like uh, everything you guys have done for dentistry. I mean, you, you really have, you, you've, we you owe it all to you, Howard. No, I'm just, I'm just the, uh, the long distance phone carrier. I'm not doing any of the conversations. It's, uh, it's guys like you and Todd Ehrlich that have just, uh, made dental town a must go to place and home. So how does, um, so what website, if I, if I want to get a hold of your books, it's, um, uh, implantsmadeeasy.com. And that's your main for the dentists out there listening. That's the main website to go to implantsmadeeasy.com. Yeah. Yeah. And, they and, and the, and if they're interested to uh, switching to uh, dental porn, it would be <laughs> digitallyenamel.com. And I, 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 I do. You, you post some amazing stuff. But, right. um, but August, I just want to tell you seriously, man, I, how many posts do you have on Dental Town? Thousands. Thousands, yeah. Thousands of posts for 15 years? Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry. I want to thank you so much for all that you've done for Dental Town. And I want thank to thank you. you for giving me an hour of your valuable time. Thank you, Howard. All right, buddy. You have a. I hope you have a happy Halloween. What are you going to dress up as? Uh, I was thinking about going as a dentist. <laughs> I'm going to go as a short, fat, bald grandpa dentist. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. All right. Have See a good later, day. Man. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.